Olá, a IUPAP, International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, está interessada em muitas coisas. Dentre elas, a definição das unidades básicas que nós usamos no dia a dia, a manutenção das constantes fundamentais, mas também está muito interessada nos desafios que a ciência tem atualmente. Na área da física são muitos os desafios. Nós temos desafios desde o entendimento das partículas elementares, da matéria condensada, na física nuclear, é, na biofísica, na astrofísica. Em todas as áreas, ou sub-áreas da física, nós temos desafios. Para que você saiba quais são esses desafios, a IUPAP organizou um workshop especial que chama-se Entendendo os Desafios da Física Moderna. Cada área da física está aqui é, sendo apresentada por um líder, membro da IUPAP, e que você terá então agora a chance de entender, através desta apresentação, os desafios que a área apresenta e como os físicos, de um modo geral, estão superando esses desafios para que a física seja um instrumento de entendimento das ciências naturais e que auxilie o homem não apenas a avançar o seu conhecimento, mas a tornar a ciência um instrumento útil da melhoria de vida de cada um existente nesse planeta e nesse universo. Assista e também faça parte do entendimento dos desafios da física moderna. Boa sorte! Final talk today is Gender and Physics, Igli, Eagle Gladhill. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to switch in a new presentation. Uh, uh, when I was learning to drive, um, my father would wait for me to struggle for a while and then say, it goes better if you take the handbrake off. So I'm just going to switch in a new presentation over here in the light of the previous ones. Okay. So I thought um, we might start with an interactive um, exercise. Um, this is a little puzzle which some of you will know, I think. There are several possible answers, so I'd ask you if you have come across this puzzle before, just to stay quiet while other people have a chance, if that's okay. A father and a son are traveling. There is a terrible accident. The father is killed. The son is rushed to the hospital to the operating theater. But the surgeon says, I, oops, it says ways. The surgeon says, I cannot operate. This is my son. So I wonder if anyone here would give me an idea of how this can be possible. Over to you. Yes. Yes, the surgeon is the son's mother. There are other possibilities. For example, we have single-sex marriages at the moment. So let me start with uh, the gender gap in physics, um, diversity and universality. And this is quite a complicated field. Uh, we're in Sao Paulo. We have some excellent graffiti. And this is almost the way that I see the field of gender in science when I think about it. It is big and complicated. So the approach that I decided to take was to use IUPAP and physics as a way of trying to decomplicate things and select certain things to introduce you to, to select a small part of the field that might be relevant to physics. Um, I'm going to introduce this by saying, what does working group five in, in um, IUPAP do? What does it actually do as a working group? It surveys the situation for women in physics and IUPAP member countries 
and it analyzes and reports the data, and it provides suggestions on how to improve the situation. And the way it does this is quite hard to choose with the limited resources we've got. And we liaise with Alenka, the gender champion. By the way, I'm sorry to say we have not solved the global problem yet. So physics progress has been made. That is a Solvay conference, um, and that is a recent conference. And there, um, I think you will notice, is there a pointer somewhere? Um, that in the left-hand photograph, um, there is something that everyone except for two people in the photograph have in common. And that is that everyone except for two people has a moustache, every person has a moustache. So um, I'll start with universality. And I think uh, you have all come across, um, thank you very much. Um, Ixu Statute 5, the Statement on Universality, which I'll summarize as universal access to science, that is to the fruits of science, and universal participation in science. And it's a, a principle that runs through um, everything. By the way, this is a green laser um, which can, at these distances, cause dazzle disorientation and possible retinal damage, um, especially if it's over five milliwatts. And then there's U UN Sustainable Development Goal 5, Gender Equality, Achieve Gender Equality and Power Girls. Now, this slide I've pinched um, from Min Song um, Lin, who is here somewhere, perhaps, and uh, it's a different kind of universality. Knowledge of science and technology is universal, but it is shaped by local culture. I think that's rather nice. So some underlying observations. This is almost the fine print um, to the talk that I'm giving. This is a very sensitive area. Um, no, it's fine. I, I, I have got it. <laughs> Oh, okay, no, no, this is good. <laughs> um, there, it is easy for things to go wrong in this field. It is extremely easy to offend people. Cultural practices run very deep indeed and need to be respected. There's room to polarize opinions and one can lose goodwill very easily, when we come to debate some of the resolutions involving gender tomorrow, you will probably find me arguing for um, the, the target rather than the um, quota, for example. Gender is a very broad concept. Um, I'm including lesbian, gay, binary, trans, and other types of um, gender. But I've confined this talk to women because of the working group mandate. And many of these ideas do apply to other kinds of, of group identities. Um, scientists and social scientists have got a lot in common, as we know from the proposed merger of ISSC and um, ICSU. And I am not a, a social scientist. So me presenting these basic principles to you is a very strange thing to do. Um, I'm a computational physicist, but I'm doing my best here. So use, useful concept number one is to plot the percentage of women in a field as a function of age or seniority or their progress to professorship. And usually a graph in science emerges which has a declining fraction of women um, and a complementary rising fraction of men. It's known as a scissors graph. In that sense, um, where these cross over, uh, this is one from genet genome biology. This is one from my own uh, uh, science council from which I've just retired um, for 2013. And note that it's a percentage in the way you plot it um, does have a bearing on how you see this data. But this, um, this curve turns up again and again um, in physics. I have never seen one that um, escapes having a negative slope for the percentage of women and being monotonic. 
So these are challenges in what we, what we choose to do. Of course, I'm nearly falling off the end of the curve there. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have both aggregate data and cohort data. Aggregate data averages over the big rectangle cohort takes a group of people at the same level and looks at data there. I'm not going to go into that further, but it's useful. The consequences of getting out of the game. So these are the laws of thermodynamics, and they really apply to this as well. You can't win. You can't break even. You can't get out of the game are the laws of thermodynamics. But um, the last law has particular application here. It has been shown informally by anecdotal evidence, I haven't seen a publication, that if you stop initiatives in terms of minorities in the workplace, you lose that ground very fast indeed, even though it took a long time to get going. So here's another one. Um, another useful concept from the social scientists, it is the schema with an A at the end, not an ER as in someone who lays plots and tries to scheme against you or whatever. These are hypotheses that affect um, expectations of a particular group, the way we recognize people, and they do affect performance at work, for example, for men and women. Uh, the, the term schema includes stereotypes, which are negative aspects, and uh, the schema is a neutral term. Here's one in terms of choice of colors. Here's another um, interesting and extremely complex field, and that is um, identity. Um, certainly when people enter a field, um, they may feel that they have a group identity and that because that group is relatively small, they feel threatened. Um, uh, one of the ways that this is overcome is through the concept of a physics identity, and there is publication on this. The physics identity says, I'm a physicist. That is my identity in this group. I have a very um, strong physics identity. Um, in general. So the picture at the top of the girl walking into an unknown situation there um, was one that I almost embraced in finding out what the world was like. Uh, there is a very old um, <laughs> type of situation with the lady standing in the middle. Uh, look at the way that she is actually standing there. That's from a physics department in South Africa in, I think, around about 1960. And there are all sorts of other assumptions there. This is an additional thing that you might find useful, which I'm sure you've come across, unconscious bias. It can be tested for. There are tests on the web for unconscious bias um, about gender. And in addition, you may come across the boardroom situation where there's someone from a minority, and the chairman, um, and I'll take the gender example that's usually the case. The chairman um, says, uh, thank you very much, any other discussion? And um, Mary says, uh, uh, and the chairman says, thanks, uh, then we'll move on. And then Mary says, I've got something to say, and the chairman says, John, did you say something? And uh, Mary says, I've got a point to make, and the chairman says, I'm sorry, but we haven't got time now. Um, this comes up in terms of cumulative disadvantage. Minor inequities add up to long-term consequences. We all understand the curves there. And it has been shown that this has an effect in salary gaps, in promotion gender gaps, in prestige gender gaps, and the ways that we can act on this are to consciously surface subconscious bias especially in, for example, selection panels. One can make the selection, come back, and say, are we exhibiting any bias here? And uh, it's quite interesting to do that. Of course, you always do that at the port point of the meeting where everyone's tired and wants to go home because they've got the final solution. Now let's move on to the nature of the problem. And I've got just one graph here to illustrate the fact that something is changing 
the gains that have been made in terms here of physics degrees earned by women in the United States as measured by the American Physical Society are leveling off. This is true also for numbers of women in the European Union in science. And we don't know why as far as I know. Um, what is the nature of the problem in physics? I seem to have brought, brought along the particular slide that has a very big number on it. Um, this group, IUPAP as us, um, and Working Group 5 as us, who work on gender problems, uh, were responsible for a survey in uh, 2011. Um, and uh, the number of respondents was um, 14,932 physicists across the world. I'm so glad that you're here, Bill Phillips. This is a really big number. This is a really big number of physicists. And uh, we're coming up to a survey next year where we want 45,000 and not just in physics. This is a survey of men and women. It doesn't make sense to look at gender unless you survey both. And uh, it was done in eight languages and 130 countries um, responded and I'll show you some data. So under the education, oops, I need to go back one. Nope, no, 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 no. Oh, oh, that's going to be particularly nasty. So um, there will be a test um, on everything that flashes past now. Um, on the education side of things, um, there are contrasts. Now you will see two sets of data here, um, uh, women and men. This particular one that I pulled out was students' quality of relationships with doctoral advisors, sorted into excellent, good, fair, and poor. And the stats are good enough in this aggregate um, sample to, to see that something is happening in physics in terms of whether people rate their um, advisors' relationships as excellent. Now, here's another interesting one. Um, this slide is a bit complicated, so I'll take a moment over it. Uh, this is under um, professional opportunities, resources, and the workplace. And this question was, have you participated in the following? On the left are less developed countries on the UN list of 2011. On the right are highly developed countries on the United Nations list. Thank you. <laughs> I thought that was a vote. <laughs> and um, these are given a talk, attended a conference, been, on an, been an editor, served on important committees, um, and advised graduates and stuff. And in all cases, the reason I sort of shaded them a dismal orange color was that in all cases, the statistics show that um, women are doing these things less. Similarly, with access to funding, lab space, office space, equipment, clerical support, and so on. I feel comfortable with raising concerns with my boss or manager. We see contrasts both between the less developed world and the more developed world, and between men and women. Um, mostly yes is green here. So in terms of the actual climate in the workplace for women, here we have um, the quality of life at 24% um, for everyone, but how do we measure the quality of life? I ask, so what should we do? And again, I'm taking the narrow view as IUPAP, we have limited resources, but we do have great influence. And I can say that I've seen it in action. We have gender champion, we have a working group, in the ICSU project, which I will introduce, we have 10 partners, IU, uh, IMU Maths, IU PAC, um, Physics, Astro, Biology, Industrial and Applied Mathematics, History and Philosophy, UNESCO, and OWSD. There are 10 of us working on a project here. And it's a confusing landscape of interventions. These are largely to do with young people. Um, and uh, how to get more young girls, because people have brilliant ideas. Um, like, for example, competitions, visiting speakers, watch the Big Bang Theory, outreach at conferences, um, traveling demonstrations, and so on. 
And for people who are going through university or going into the working world, um, we have a big landscape as well. We need to end sexual harassment. We need to set serious targets. Um, we can evaluate not on the, uh, on the quality of papers, rather than quantity of papers. And it has been done. And there's data. And these are all successful in different ways. And they all have possibilities. They're all right for different environments. We're dealing with cultures across the world. What works in Iran may not work in the Philippines. Impact is difficult to define, and I, have, I do guard against quantitative impact measures. Um, everyone's enthusiastic, and all these things are needed. So what should we do? We need to tunnel through the obstacles. The picture was originally of a glass ceiling. Um, I've made it a, a, a barrier horizontally instead. And this is rule one in my view. We make it possible to make change by having a safe environment in which to raise concerns. This comes up again and again and address them. And uh, here is an expansion on the themes coming through in that particular study. Definitely uh, personal safety, Definitely fairness, we cannot do without those. Safe environment in which to raise concerns, access to research and study funding, a huge one, a cordial relationship with colleagues, departmental atmosphere, recognition of achievements, flexible hours, a sympathetic boss came up um, in this particular one. And these are things which help men and help women. These are for everyone, but they have been shown to be the ones that women choose as the right thing to do. So I'm going to come to um, what we do and our actions. We have a gender gap, uh, first of all, a joint global survey in the ICSU Gender Gap Project. There is more available information on the web. Um, and uh, we do run an international conference on women in physics. Uh, right. I have lost my place here somehow. OK. Um, we um, develop the Waterloo Charter, which is a guide to best practice for women in physics. We have actions within IUPAP. And if you look at actions on that curve, the um, pipeline curve or the scissors curve, the percentage of women is a function of seniority. The black curve is the one that um, uh, happens more or less all over the world. We need to move people towards the right. All those actions will be useful. We may also make it easier for people to return from raising a family. And I'm saying people, not just women. It's very difficult to come back. And there are ways of helping people to come back. Here's the International Conference on Women in Physics. Um, it's wonderful to have Nobel laureates um, around, and uh, here is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Malala Yousafzai, who was um, shot in the head in Pakistan, recovered, and came to an IUPAP conference this year. At this conference, we have workshops, continuing professional development. Um, we talk about gender issues. Every country bring, brings a paper on its progress. There are scientific papers, plenary speakers, and um, formulation of resolutions and recommendations. The Waterloo Charter um, is in draft form, and it has a set of guiding principles. And, uh, I will leave these in the presentation and make it available, but these are the guiding principles. They include both thought and action are necessary. This is not um, something that one can put down on paper and then pay lip service to. There are recommendations for affirmative actions, the global survey, the global project with ICSU, there's the web reference, the Waterloo Charter, um, <laughs> um, and to sum up, we want to create an environment which is stimulating, have awareness of our own reactions, figure out where we're going, um, and keep an open mind, but don't let your brains fall out. But there's homework, if I may put it that way. 
In this joint global survey that's coming up, we target 45,000 respondents. We need you to participate and submit and help people submit on time and provide samples. We do request your help and support. Thank you. Questions? Bill? So I have a comment and a question. You showed that iconic picture of the 1911 Solvay Conference uh, with only Marie Curie as uh, the, uh, the only woman attending. I uh, attended uh, the 2011 Solvay Conference, uh, billed as the, uh, the 100th, uh, and there were more women, but the percentage was lower. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yes. yes <laughs> so that's, things that's aren't always getting better. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. anyway, uh, yeah. the question is, your, your curve about um, uh, a negative slope, monotonic uh, uh, decay of participation of women of different levels of seniority has at least two different extreme interpretations. The optimistic one would be that things are constantly getting better uh, and uh, what we're seeing is simply the, uh, the play out of time. And the other one is, of course, that, that women don't get promoted or, and women drop out. And I'm wondering if you could give us some sense of how much of each of those uh, yes. scenarios are at work there. Yeah. Um, I actually asked this question myself in 2003 in a national survey of physics in South Africa because I saw a curve like this, and said, oh, this looks like a wave propagating up the axis. Now we are um, essentially half a lifetime down there, and the curve um, is not looking great. It's not a wave moving to the right. Um, I can't cite literature to um, support that statement, but it is a leaking pipeline. And um, there are a lot of studies on the fact that the pipeline leaks and why. Very few um, really on uh, successfully getting that curve to move to the right. I'm sorry about that. I also wanted the wave. Another question? If not, thank you again. It's time for beer. <laughs>